Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Lisa Van Pelt. Hi Lisa. Hi Joanna. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Lisa is a book binder, which is very exciting, specializing in designing and producing limited edition fine press books, cases, boxes, and paste papers. And you can see examples of her work at lvpbookbinding.com uh, because of course this is such a visual media. Now, Lisa, like I'm grinning like a crazy person because it's so romantic. It just seems so romantic to be a book binder. So tell us, how did you become a book binder and what do you love about it? Well, sometimes I used to tell people that I just got into book binding so that I could have these big, huge cast iron pieces of equipment in my studio. But um, basically, I got into it because I studied book binding. Uh, no, I didn't actually study book binding in college, but I studied architecture in college. And then after college, I apprenticed with a book binder in uh, Western Massachusetts, which oddly enough is a hotbed, no pun intended, of letterpress printers and book binders and book related artists and artisans. And book binding, oddly enough, uses some of the same skill sets as architecture. So designing and building books is similar to designing and building buildings, but just on a very small scale. Hmm. So that's how I got into it. And that's what I love about it. The sort of design element and the actual getting to build what you design, um, the collaborative process between the bookbinder myself and whatever artist or small press, whoever's commissioning the work, we collaborate in designing the binding, the structure, the materials, all that sort of thing. So that's really what I love about it. It's really just a fantastic way to spend time. Yeah, it, it sounds so awesome, but I think we should probably just get back to basics. There might be people listening yeah. who don't really understand what book binding is. Um, so, you know, many people listening will be authors who have Create Space or even Ingram Spark print on demand. Some people might have done a limited edition print run, but I, I, there will probably be very few people who have had a project with, working with someone like you. So maybe you could just explain, like, what's the difference or w w what is it actually? So the word, so of course, bookbinding is, uh, there's a whole spectrum of what people do in bookbinding and it can go anything from, you know, blurb online or, or doing like in print through in Ingram Spark and then, which is all, mach you know, machine based and then you know, there's the trade paperback in the middle and then there's, you know, the hardcover trades and then there's the handbound sort of spectrum of things. And, you know, I have friends who will get a book, be able, who as a book binder will be able to get a book digitally printed and then hand bind the cover. I work with people who are, I work with letterpress printers or printers who are printing in some other fashion mm -hmm. and they do the printing and then I get the sheets from them and do all of the work of creating, turning those sheets into an, a book. And whether that's just the binding or it's the boxes that's housed in and all of that sort of thing. So along that spectrum, I'm sort of on the far end where, you know, rare book publishers are commissioning the work of say one to five, 50 copies of something. So it's a small edition, uh, fine press books that are usually, usually end up in, uh, institutions or rare book libraries. So kind of, um, it's a rarefied, uh, sort of art form. So sort of, I make books the way we used to do 500 years ago, basically. Yeah, which is cool. <laughs> We're going to come back to the death of print in a minute. Um, but I do, I do just want to come back. You mentioned having massive equipment in your studio. I mean, I've, I've done a, I did one day of book binding and I made this little notebook thing and it was awesome. And you, it was full of like crazy equipment. So I'm just really interested, like how expensive are those big devices like because they not too many people must want them to be fair <laughs> not too many people want them they really don't make them like they used to I mean you can actually buy the modern day version of some of the things like the two pieces I have are really just um massive I try not to move very often because they take a lot of 
you know, the, the standing press that I have is seven feet tall and it weighs almost a thousand pounds. And just because it's cast iron, you know, obviously they don't make them like they used to for some good reasons, but, um, but also they function really well. And I, I think I got, uh, the cutter that I have, which has, uh, it's this massive board shears and it has a four foot blade basically so I can cut very large pieces of material. And, um, I got that from an Amish guy in Pennsylvania who, uh, who used to collect those things and refurbish them and remachine machine parts and sort of keep them up and running. But they're, you know, it's a hundred years old or more than that. So, um, the new, newfangled versions you can purchase, um, but the the old so those old tools they make them still but the the functionality is still the same so it's it's very non mechanized um you know mostly just beautiful function of old machines so not to not that there aren't new um or mechanized things that I use. Like I used a hot stamping machine for titling book covers. And so it's obviously electric. And so I use that to heat up type in order to uh, use, uh, basically do a foil stamping of a, of a title on covers and mm. labels and things like that. And then I actually use a dry mount press. So that's pretty newfangled machinery. Um, and I use that to back, back cloth in order to use it, back it with back cloth with paper in order to use it in books. Mm. And then of course there's a bunch of hand tools, which you got introduced to in the, uh, you know, the bone folder and the, um, you know, all kinds of knives and pairing tools for pairing leather and all sorts of things like that. That's very cool. That's it's awesome. But it, I mean, it sounds like tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. Oh, that's right. That was your question. How much does it cost? Um, so, uh, you know, so the the board shears that I use, um, I don't know. Maybe it was a few thousand dollars. Mm. Uh, that was that was fifteen years ago. So yeah, I guess uh, they last a long time. <laughs> they do. I'll never have to buy a new one. <laughs> So, um, and who knows if I'd ever be able to get rid of it, but um, I may go to the grave with that. <laughs> but, well, so I, think, I think that's interesting. I mean, I, and I guess the reason I asked is because I went to this particular, you know, workshop where people could go and rent the equipment and things. So right. we're not suggesting like people yeah. would set themselves up with all the equipment, but there are often in certain bigger cities, right. people can go to these workshops, can't they? Maker spaces and use exactly. them collectively. Exactly. And there's centers for the book in lots of the large cities like San Francisco, near where I am, you know, New York, all all sorts of, you know, outside the United States. There are different different types of either maker spaces that just happen to have book binding tools or um, what usually get called like San Francisco Center for the Book. Mm -hmm. And they have, you know, both letterpress printing tools and also book binding tools you can rent time in the studio and take classes to learn how to use the equipment, all that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's super fun. And I think that's the best way for people to get started. And as I said, you know, I'm, I think as a business person, as an, as an author, we have to focus on digital because that's where the profit oh, yeah. margin is. But yeah. um, let's, I want to ask you the, the question that boringly everybody asks uh, everywhere I speak. It always comes up. In fact, I was at this conference last weekend. So, you know, it was on the future of the book and someone put their hand right. up and said, seriously, is it, are e-books the death of print? And I just want to bang my head against the wall. <laughs> but, um, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts, you know, in terms of the so-called death of print or what is happening with print are we seeing like vinyl you know resurgence type of thing or what do you right. think that it's all happening right well i i look at it as uh ebooks solve a different problem than print so they are by far the best uh mode of getting information and text distributed far and wide for the most or the least amount of production cost just like the trade paperback, what answered that question back in its day, hmm. and now eBooks are doing that. And so, I guess you could make an argument 
for um, the development of ebooks pushing print into it could push print into a new direction. Like there could be more of a, a resurgence of interest in the sort of specialty print objects or beautiful print, as I've heard you mention before. And, and so that could sort of push that into more of a, a specialized type of presentation of a text or artwork. Um, but just like digital photography didn't, uh, make painting obsolete. I feel like they're two different, um, they're res responding to two different problems or mm -hmm. questions or needs or whatever. So, and obviously ebooks are not the depth of reading because more and more people have more access to reading material through ebooks. So, um, I don't, I don't see that the rarefied world that I am in, in terms of printing and book binding, I don't see that declining because of eBooks. Um, I, I don't know how many, perhaps the trade hardback industry is sort of less robust than it used to be, but I'm not sure that that's a terrible thing, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't make any proclamations, but so but, that's that's what I would say. Mm, but you haven't like you haven't seen your but you're not worried about your business falling apart because ebooks are going to eat your lunch, right? No, no, no. I definitely we're responding to different part different uh, world of books. So mm. I, you know, I do that thing where I, you know, I obviously re uh, buy and read ebooks. I sometimes buy the hard copy of the ebook that I own because I like to look look at things or, you know, dog ear pages or things like that. I like the physical nature of the book still. So I think for different uses, different types of material, um, print maybe for me is still the most useful form, but the immediacy of the ebook often gets me to buy both. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you're an ideal reader. And and I have like, so I have some books in, in print, ebook and audio. So I right. mean, yeah, exactly. it's kind exactly. of crazy, but only nonfiction actually, which brings me to the question, what are the best types of projects for the limited edition work that you do? So, or what are some examples of projects that people would invest that money? Like, I can't see me ever doing like a service like yours for, you know, one of my novels, which are fast paced thrillers that, you right. read and finish, right. but maybe with a nonfiction book. Um, so what are some of the projects you do and what are the books that suit this kind of work? So the type of stuff that I do is, uh, so small presses or uh, rare book publishers will commission me to do these like limited edition books. And they tend to be original artwork paired with prose or poetry. So these are the kind of what what in trade language would be the coffee table book, but they're the sort of, these end up in the libraries and, and rare book collections. And so, so that, so the higher price allows us to focus on the beauty of the materials and the functionality of, you know, a, an interesting binding um, or, you know, making sure it opens in a particular way. And so that you move through the images and the, poetry or whatever it is in a particular, not only sequence, but a rate and you have a certain, it's really controlling the experience, controlling, it's, uh, it's sort of building that experience of moving through the work of art. And so that's the, that's the sort of book that it would make sense to do, you know, a high end fine binding with because that's the sort of book that a book collector is going to bring into their library or mm. you know the Getty Museum is going to put in their collection or something like that for for however then I was mentioning before that I have a you know know somebody who they digitally print a book for someone mm. and then put a binding on that like they they work with it in the same way in the sense that they're working with the client and they're designing something that reflects the character of the book mm. but it's a, because it's digitally printed 
it really brings down the cost. And so there's that sort of interim, different steps along the spectrum that you can use hand binding. Oh, that's really interesting. So the, and um, like the, I know this is, could be as long as a piece of string, but the people who then sell those books, cause you're like, you're the craftsperson and then they are the ones selling those finished products, right? Are, right. are they like, you know, they would sell them for sort of 50 to $250, like that type of price range? More in the um, few thousand. Oh, really? Uh, wow. 5,000 range, <gasps> sort of. That's sort of where, that's where a lot, it's, you know, it can be as low as maybe a thousand and then up upwards of that. Wow. So, How much and, bling and, on that? <laughs> right. Well, and a lot of the bling is the artwork inside. Like, for instance, it's a well known artist. And so mm -hmm. they're, they're collectible. And that's why we're spending all this time and money on the binding and that sort of thing. But not necessarily all well-known artists and um, not by far not all well-known artists. But um, it's sort of it's not just the binding that's creating the bling, but it's definitely the art and the the poetry or whatever's inside. So, yeah, it's definitely a book that I can't afford. And it obviously that's exactly why it's not answering this accessibility question. What I would really like is is that in the future of virtual reality, we'll be able to go into libraries and be able to turn through mm. these you know, rare books and actually experience them. Because right now they're very, they're pretty, they're pretty inaccessible to the general public mm. unless you make an appointment with a rare book librarian and go see the work. And you can do that, absolutely, but it's not the same as it's, it's yeah, and it's interesting because the British Library, um, they've digital, digitized a lot of like the Codex Sinaiticus, you know, and a lot of the really old manuscripts. So you can you can open it online so you can see it on a browser and you can zoom in. But like what you're saying with virtual reality and that kind of haptic, the touch, that's what I right. would want. Because, yeah, sure, right. I can zoom in and look at it on screen, but that doesn't I don't know what vellum that's four thousand years old feels like feels like exactly or i mean i don't know how they will do like. that maybe yeah. we can have that too <laughs> smells yeah. like yeah i mean that's and and i mean talking of virtual reality i would love like to come and watch you in vr do your right. stuff i mean there's definitely ways that crafts people can can you know expand in that world and i think this kind of physical craft is a really good example of how that will help but let's just let's just come back because i'm still like wow seriously there are books that are that expensive <laughs> So um, Ted, tell us about the materials. I mean, yeah, everyone's like, oh, okay, so maybe gold leaf on on there somehow. Sure. But but what are the what are the types of materials you would you would typically work with, or that you get excited about working with? So they can they run the gamut, of course. And so you know, there's obviously book cloth and leather and vellum and um, handmade papers. I do uh, custom paste papers, which is just painted paper, you know, in designs for specific projects. Um, one project, I use this very thin, uh, very thin metal. It was thin enough, not foil thin, but thin enough that you could fold it over a board. But basically I patinaed it using a blowtorch. And so I was like painting with a blowtorch on this metal and, you know, and so you're, you've got all and you know you can use i mean you can basically you go to the any art store or hardware store you go to you can figure out look at those materials and figure out how to use them in a book you know wooden covers so all basically if you can if you can uh corral a material to a sort of small form you can use it in a book and that and doing that, doing that sort of crazy kind of, t you try to use this material in a book. That's part of where the, that's part of where the cost comes in, but also where the design fun comes in as well. Trying to figure out how can we use, you know, uh, I don't know, some, one of my clients will give me these crazy cloth uh, that are not book cloth. They're not meant to be used in book cloth, partly because, you know, they don't function quite as well as a book cloth would. But after a while of making books, you've seen all the book cloths. And so if you wanna have a unique and original presentation to your book, you'll go out and find a material that is 
you know, off the beaten path and try to make it work for a book. Like is people like artist Louise Bourgeois. She made a book entirely out of her bed sheets, you know, mm. so unique, very unique to her. And so, you know, people will do crazy stuff like that. That is really cool. I definitely, I mean, when I did that book binding thing, I was like, one day I will print my own paper, put my own, right. you know, words right. on it and, you know, work with someone like you to make some beautiful product. Because, um, it, yeah, it's just so cool. But I did want to ask you um, the weird question. Uh, in my book, Deviance, uh, I have a character who basically does book binding with human skin, which has a name for everyone listening, anthropomorphic bibliopegy, which is right. skin from human bodies. And uh, my character uses tattoos and, and makes them. But I mean, it's just leather, right? Human skin is is right. is leather. So, I mean, have you right. worked with anything really weird like that? Or, or um, yeah, I mean, it's straight or, or no of these strange projects? Well, I haven't, I have not, I admit, worked with anything <laughs> as exotic as human skin. But it's true that after it's, after you've processed it, it would function I imagine very similarly to calf skin or sheep skin or goat skin. Goats, though, you know, we particularly use calf and goat skin in uh, the work that I do. But yeah, I mean, so that's definitely an example of taking a material and and you know figuring out how to use it for for a book to obtain a, you know a particular uh, effect. <laughs> as I imagine it does. <laughs> Creepy so, effect. Yeah, right? I mean, that's what's so cool. I mean, vellum is calf skin, right? Yeah, well, and goat skin, so it can be either. And they even have things, um, oh, what's it called? Like, there's some, there's some, I wrote it down because I don't use it, but there's, it's kind of more in the grotesque, and it's called uterine calf parchment. So it's a little... I don't use it, and I haven't actually heard of it until I started doing some research on vellum. But there's all sorts of, you know, more, there's all sorts of interesting, weird, and you know, maybe things you might not want to use, but it's out there and available for you. So <laughs> I maybe not that. on a big scale, but on a small scale. On a small yes. scale. I do. I mean, I think I think it's really fascinating. Like you said, you have to start thinking, well, um, you know, if you find a material you like, how could you use that or something that has a meaning? Um, so Cory Doctorow did some handbound of his own books and he put yeah. um, he used some of his own something in the cover so that it really was limited edition, a bit like the right. Louise you mentioned. So exactly. making that limited edition personal thing, I think, is right. really interesting. Um, yeah. No, that's very cool. And then you, you mentioned there, obviously, the collaboration process of design um, and how, you know, how, how much do you get to input into the design and how much are you, you know, letting the client come up with something or do they trust you with things? What's the collaboration process? It ranges. So I, I tend to have a repeat clients. So a client will do one or two books a year and I'll do them with them. And some of those clients uh, come with a material. Like I want to use apple green leather on this book. I don't know how, but mm. here it is and see what you can come up with. And then I read the text and I figure out what the book is sort of trying to, to say and um, or, you know, what I think it's saying to me, and then come up with a binding that sort of works with that. So in the green calfskin and, uh, realm, it was about, the, the title was Skin of Grace, and so we, it was sort of about a skin, the skin that, you know, overlays the skeleton. Not as macabre as that sounds, but <laughs> but in that realm. And so... Uh, so we, I used, you know, designed a spine where you could see the sewing through the spine. And so it was like you were seeing the skeleton of the book through the skin, like literally the goat skin. So, um, so, or, and then sometimes somebody will come and with a, a book and a real idea for what type of, even what type of book structure they want. And I'll do things like suggest different, you know, materials, suggest maybe a structure, you know, I'll give them the pros and cons of what they want. Like that structure can be great for this, but it also won't lie flat. If 
you wanted to lie flat, we could adjust it in this sort of way. Um, so it sort of walk them through what they want and make sure they know the pros and cons of each because everything has a upside and a downside. Mm. And, um, and, and then there's the other spectrum where I'm just, where they're like, do this, do just, well, the other spectrum where people's like, uh, I don't know, I want something, I want something really, you know, fun or different or whatever. And then I'll just come with them, come with ideas, you know, mm-hmm. I'll spend time in the middle of the night imagining new and interesting ways to put a book together and then tell them about it. <laughs> I love that. I hope, I hope other people, I'm like, oh, wow, this sounds like a dream job. Maybe I should do this. <laughs> And it's so funny because as a, I think maybe anyone who wants to write or is a writer has this attraction to the print book that will never right. go away. And it's kind of a completely separate thing to the business of being a writer, um, which is quite strange. And we'll come back to the business of being a craftsperson in a minute. But um, just just t- talk a bit about fonts, because fonts are one of those things that um, everyone struggles with in book design, I think. Um, yeah. Are there different fonts for the the binding? Or, you know, are you using the same types of fonts everyone else is? Or, you know, how does that work? So the, the printer who's printing the book, and the, sometimes it's the designer or the the book publisher will be involved with the printer and helping them, you know, picking the particular font that works well with the text. I am basically replicating the font that is in the book so as to marry, you know, the cover with the text. Mm. But but of course all the text and similar problem to book design and ebooks, the font, you know, it it contributes or detracts from readability. Uh, there's fonts that have a lot of space in them, some that has very little. And, you know, so usually the printers and publishers doing these books that I bind, they look for a font that, you know, is trying to express the character. They have a little more leeway, right? So mm. the, it's usually not as text heavy as an, you know, a work of fiction or something like that. And so the readability is maybe le- that slide bar on the readability is less of the important. And, you know, for instance, I just bound a book that the the cover title is calligraphy, but I can't read it at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you know, I didn't do the calligraphy, you know, and it's gorgeous as a work of art in and of itself, but mm. it's not exactly like you're going to read the letters in there. So. You know, so we have a little more leeway in that, but, you know, but there are fonts that, you know, if it's, it's a book about flight, you might choose Centaur because it has a lot of air in it, or, you know, you can really take it to all these, you know, minute levels of, um, reference and, Mm. and style. So, but that's definitely, I'm glad that that is the printer's job because Mm. it's definitely a difficult task to to choose fonts yeah it's one of those crazy things but yeah like you say it really gives an idea so that would offer like you mentioned about designing the paper as well like some of the you know um what was it and and papers yeah paste papers i don't really know what that is um what what is a paste paper it's basically a decorative paper it's it's another 500 year old art sort of thing where you take starch and paint and put them together and by starch, I mean like flour and you make a flour paste and you put paint in there and, and you're able to paint that onto a piece of paper and make designs in it. The starch basically makes it so that you can work with the paint and move it around before it dries. Mm. And so you can come up with, you know, just simple lines or whole, you know, intricate patterns and you can do individual artworks just with paste painting as well but I when I make a paste paper I'm making something that I can replicate a hundred times which limits the amount of individuality from sheet to sheet although every sheet is different because Mm. it's handmade and so when I make those for a project I will basically try to communicate it's just like making a, usually what I'm doing is I'm making paste papers for the cover. And so just like in designing an ebook cover where you're trying to get, you're trying to communicate something about the book through what the cover looks like. That's what I'm trying to do with the paste paper as well. Mm. 
And is, I'm imagining like a bit like stirring some big pot and then putting it in a, in a big trough. And, you know, is, is that what it's like? Or is that... So you, you mix up your paint in a, in a sort of bucket or a jar or whatever it is, big enough for a large paintbrush, sort of like a um, maybe as big as a house paintbrush would be. So and then I the method I use is I dip the whole piece of paper in a water bath and I lay it out on a piece of glass and I sponge off the water and then I paint on the the paint and the paint that's mixed with paste and then I've got that really flat surface and the paper stuck to the glass and then I can work with the paint on top of it and then I take it up put it on a clothesline forget about it and move on to the next one so, so it's cool. a very simple, very simple process and really fun. Like that's one of the things like if if you get to like learn bookbinding, sometimes like one of the fun, funnest workshop stuff is like painting your paper or making paper or mm. doing stuff like that. So then there's a, the book structures and all that sort of thing too. But Yeah. Wow. That sounds really fun. I think I might be better at that. I'm just not very good at... Um angles and I remember when I did the little one book that I did and you have to fold everything and I was just like yeah right. I don't know like whatever and <laughs> right yeah and you have to do all that properly whereas the paper bit sounds a bit more like woo you could just do a little more loosey goosey yes. <laughs> yeah 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 creative it's really creative it's really fun oh that sounds really cool you do so many cool things so I did want to ask you about the you know the business of being a creative versus the creative side of being a creative so how do you market your services and your work mm -hmm. so the work that I do tends to be word of mouth um if I were going to do more you know so I have my website online but it's sort of like a business card online the way it tends to function in my uh work um I do you know, I can go to in person to book events in the Bay Area and that's, you know, and meet more of the publishers and the printers and the artists and things like that. And that it's basically key. Um, just being involved in the community is another way to get word of mouth uh, work. So it's all sort of word of mouth. Um, but of course, I only do five or six projects a year. So there's not a lot of um you don't need a lot of clients to make the business run so mm -hmm. and not to, not that other so other book binders might do shorter or smaller projects so that they end up doing more per year and or you have studio assistants that can help you do more projects and all of that type of thing i i work alone in my studio and do a small number of projects and so that means the word of mouth that is going right now is what um, works for my business. Mm. Um, I could, I could, you know, and then to ramp it up, you know, to hire uh, more studio assistants and get more work, then it would require um, usually probably uh, more in this sense, more contacting of the printers that I know, the what, what we call in the business shaking the trees. So, you know, you're contacting the people, you know, who are doing projects and sort of getting on their radar and things like that. Mm. But then I do things like I try to connect with other people in my field by having an Instagram account. So my Instagram account, I just basically post photos of different um different steps I'm doing in the process or a finished book or, you know, or it's raining today or whatever it is. And I follow a bunch of printers and binders and, um, it's, it's really fun to see their work helps inspire me, especially helps being a lone craftsperson off in an orchard somewhere, stay connected to sort of the wider world of book binding. And so the internet has, I think, been a boon for that kind of connection. You can be this craftsperson on your own or with a couple people in a studio and still be able to connect with people in, in your industry, people, you know, be inspired by the work they're doing, share successes. And that's a really fun part of how social media has, helps the craftsperson, I guess. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Tell people what your Instagram is. Oh, my Instagram is an odd name. It's Looky Lisa, like uh, L 
O O K I E L I S A. So it's nothing to do with my business name or anything like that. But uh, yeah. So well, people can people stuff. can check that out to see some of the things we've been talking yeah. about. So right, there's just uh, one more question I I have for you, which is you know really thinking about the the handmade and the the maker movement. I mean, you know, I follow quite a few makers, uh, you know, who do the maker fair and, you know, this kind of rise of the, you know, do it yourself thing, even down to things like small batch beer, which has become really big and Etsy and, you know, even someone like Etsy feels mainstream now. It's really funny, you know, people really does. Yeah. Doing that. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, so what do you see for the handmade and maker movement and this kind of, like you mentioned artisan at the beginning, you know, do you, what, what do you think is going to happen with that movement as we move in more and more into the technology side on the one hand? Right. I think, I think more of what I was just saying is, you know, being able to be that craftsperson that lone craftsperson or artist, uh, being able to do that while staying connected with the rest of your community. It, for my personal experience, it's helped, uh, it's challenged me to make better things, more interesting designs, having access to you know not only historical works, but what's happening currently is just a way to stimulate my imagination and create better, make me create better work. Um, I definitely see, you know, the people, you know, people can learn things without leaving their home, of course, you know, so they, if you want to become a knitter, you can learn how to knit, you can join a Facebook group and uh, of people maybe in your area or not share all these types of things and then use that in, street protests and you know so you could definitely it i think it, it's sort of interesting how the maker movement is using technology in the internet world to both uh, help them learn new skills but also connect to others and then bring it out into the world like with yarn bombing and i don't know why knitting is my only <laughs> example but i don't even knit but anyway <laughs> They're doing some really cool things with it. So um, I basically, I think I would just expect more growth in that area and people connecting more and able to learn more, people providing more information online uh, to share skills, you know, so you can build your house watching YouTube and things like that. But, um, you know, with the indie, with the indie publishing industry, indie music, all of these things, people, it just seems like things are much more accessible. Uh, You want to learn something, it's very easy to do it in term, not, you know, you have to commit time and everything, but it's easy to access Mm. the, the information and easy to connect with people who then want to also, uh, take it out into the real world. And, you know, people are learning things that they're creating with their hands. I think it's, um, humans just have an innate desire to create. And so whether it's in a virtual way, I, or not, I do think, you know, building something with your hands, making something with your hands, even if it's cooking, you know, doing that is such a human, human activity and human desire that I think the access to more information that you get through the digital world will just be a boon to that sort of hum- part of human experience. Mm, yeah, I agree. And I mean, I see even more people getting into it as, um, you know, if we say the, you know, rise of robot outsourcing, for example, and, you know, what I think will be universal basic income, I think people are going to have more time. Um, they, it might be forced upon them. Uh, but, right. they, you know, and also people living longer. I think, you know, a lot of people getting into this stuff are people right. who've finished yes. their job and now they have time to do this. So right. um, I think there's a lot of potential. And I certainly think with indie authors, I think there's going to be a huge growth. And, you know, I think with the with the maker movement as well. So I've very exciting times. And it's so lovely to hear about your process. And uh, I know people will be very interested in seeing some pictures so tell us where can people find you and everything you do online sure 
Well, to make it easy, you can type in lisavanpelt.com and that will take you to my bookbinding website where there's a galleries of the work that I've done. And you can also sign up to get a email notification when I actually publish my book, whose the protagonist is a bookbinder. So Ooh, you can learn more about bookbinding that way too. Oh, I got to ask: and, um, is uh, is the four foot blade involved in your novel? <laughs> in the story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Not in a, not in a sort of uh, bloody way, maybe, but. Yeah. I was at my ears pricked up at that. I was like, "Oh, that sounds like yeah. a murder weapon." Got to work that twenty next story. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, great. So, um, yeah, sorry. Give us that URL again. So, LisaVanPelt dot com, and also there are links to my social media: Instagram, Pinterest, um, which I use a lot in you know designing stuff. So, um, and Twitter. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Lisa. That was great. Thank you, Joanna. Thanks for having me.